All right. Good morning and welcome to this week's edition of Encompass Live. I am your host, Krista Porter, here at the Nebraska Library Commission. Encompass Live is the Commission's weekly webinar series where we cover a variety of topics that may be of interest to libraries. We broadcast the show live every Wednesday morning at 10 a.m. Central Time, but if you're unable to join us on Wednesdays, that's fine. We do record the show every week, as we are doing today, and it will be available in our archives um, later for you to watch at your convenience. And I will show you at the end of today's show where you can, um, where you can access all of our recordings. Both the live show and the recordings are free and open to anyone to watch. So please share uh, with your friends, family, neighbors, colleagues, uh, anyone you think might be interested in any of the topics we have on Encompass Live. Um, for those of you not from Nebraska, the Nebraska Library Commission is the state agency for libraries. Uh, we are similar to your state library. Uh, which is called a commission. Uh, so we provide services and training and resources to all types of libraries in the state. So we will have shows on Encompass Live for, for all types, uh, public, academic, K-12, uh, corrections, museums, archives, um, anything and everything. Really our only criteria is that it's something to do with libraries, um, something cool libraries are doing, um, something we think they could be doing, um, resources. We do um, book reviews, interviews, mini training sessions, demos of services and products, all sorts of things. Uh, we have Nebraska Library Commission staff that sometimes do presentations for us on Encompass Live uh, about resources and things we have available to the commission, but we also bring in guest speakers and that's what we have today. Uh, with us this morning is Lane Gibson. Good morning, Lane. <laughs> Um, and they're from our Lincoln City Libraries right here in Lincoln, just up the street. Um, well, I'm not sure if you are up the street from us or some, which branch you're at <laughs> right now physically, but. Um, and this is a session that was, um, we had originally had scheduled back in March and unfortunately due to illness, it got, it had to be canceled, um, but we're so glad we we're able to get you back and have it rescheduled and that um, everyone was able to join us today. Um, so I'm just going to hand it over to you, Lane, to talk us about eh, to talk to us about reading the rainbow. All right. Thank you so much, Krista. Um, and I will be trying to make eye contact with my webcam here, but <laughs> we'll see how well that goes. So if I'm staring off into the distance, it's because I'm looking at the other monitor. Um, no <laughs> so. Uh, and thank you to Encompass Live and the Nebraska Library Commission for having me, and thank you to everyone who's attending. Um, I'm excited, it's a little bit nervous to be presenting here today. So um, there is a lot to get through. I will be talking relatively fast. I tend to be a fast talker, um, but if you've got questions or need clarification on something, feel free to put that in the chat and I will do my best to uh, address it. Um, so welcome to Read the Rainbow, serving the LGBTQIA plus community in your library. And if you are confused or intimidated by all those letters, don't worry, because that's like my second slide. Um, a bit about me. Uh, my name is Lane, as Krista mentioned, and I work at Lincoln City Library. Specifically right now, I work at the Gear Branch Library. So not just up the street, but uh, still in town here. Um, my favorite genre is fantasy. Um, I am also part of the uh, ALA's Rainbow Roundtable. So that's, um, the part of the American Library Association that specifically talks about LGBTQ issues um, and services in libraries. Um, I'm also a member of the Barbara Ginnings uh, Literature Award for Adult Fiction, which is part of ALA's Stonewall Book Awards. So I have the honor and the privilege of getting a ton of LGBTQ adult fiction uh, throughout the year and reading it and evaluating it. and um, serving on the committee for that award. So I do read a lot of queer fiction um, and I am also a board member for the Nebraska Library Association. I am the chair of the bylaws and handbook committee as well as the chair for the diversity interest group. So I'm very, very busy and usually very, very uh, behind on things I need to get done, but that's just a bit about me. Um, so all of the letters in that big old acronym we use. And I won't dwell too much on this just because there's so many other things to cover. Um, but LGBTQ, 
um, IA, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer, intersex, and asexual. Um, and I have a little note here that saying is queer a bad word. A lot of people, especially not LGBTQ people, are sort of afraid to use the word queer um, because historically it has been used as a slur, uh, just as gay has been used as a slur. I mean, um, when I was in school, that's what you called each other was gay as an insult. Uh, so queer is a reclaimed slur, which means that the community itself has decided to take the negative power away from that word and turn it into something positive. So at the current moment, and this can always change, um, but queer is the currently accepted academic term. So we refer to things like queer literature, queer media, queer studies, queer history. That's something you'll see in journals and in academic papers. Um, that being said, there are still members of our community uh, who have had that word uh, used against them in a derogatory way and have been traumatized by that word. So my general rule of thumb is if somebody tells you, hey, I have trauma associated with that word, just don't use it with them and um, respect mm -hmm. that. Um, that being said, throughout this presentation, I will be using the word queer. So if that's an issue for you, just know that I'm going to be saying that word a lot. Um, I'm going to jump in right here while you've got that slide up there with all of those. Um, oh, and then the next one too, because uh, someone asked about this and I was going to mention it earlier and I just didn't. Um, the slides will be available afterwards as well with the recording. So um, don't um, don't worry about trying to scribble down all of these things. <laughs> um, just sit back and listen, maybe take some notes if there's anything you do find interesting, but you will have these full slides available to you afterwards when we post the archive. Thank you, Krista. There's also going to be some links uh, later on that obviously you won't be able to click now, but you will be able to click later. Nice. Um, so here are just some other um, identities or labels that are used um, that are under this LGBTQ umbrella here. Again, I'm not going to really go into all of them and explain what they mean. Um, you are free to do that on your own, but um, be aware that there are many diverse identities within uh, the LGBTQ community and everyone identifies differently. Um, something I will say is that, and this is applies throughout, you don't have to necessarily understand each identity, you just have to be able to um, accept those identities. So if somebody comes up to you and they say, well, I'm a uh, pan-romantic, asexual, non-binary woman, you don't have to know what that means but you should be able to say thank you for trusting me with that information how would you like me to refer to you what pronouns to use something like that you know so you don't have to necessarily get it um to be able to accept somebody's identity and to support that identity and they will likely explain it to you if you ask uh in a way that is polite and not condescending or aggressive um there's also, you might see different versions of the pride flag. The standard flag is uh, the Gilbert Baker flag. Um, and that one actually has the pink stripe, which a lot of modern uh, flags don't have. And the reason for that is because in like the nineties, uh, when this flag was created, it was really expensive to print pink. <laughs> so they, they cut it off, but there is a pink flag or a pink stripe there. Um, the Philly pride flag uh, has the black and the brown stripe. And that one was, created specifically in Philadelphia um, to bring attention to the struggles and issues faced by uh, Black Indigenous people of color, specifically um, within Philly in the LGBTQ community. And uh, so those were added. And then the Progress Pride flag, which you see a lot now this day, is, takes the Philly Pride flag and then also adds the trans colors. Um, to again specifically highlight inclusion for the trans community as that became an issue. Um, I will also say that the rainbow flag, it does represent everyone regardless. So identities will have their own flags, but the rainbow flag is a cover all. So it's for everyone. Um, and again, I won't go too much on that because we've got so much other stuff to get to, but I'm happy to answer questions about that as well. So why do you, dear library worker, um, care about these issues. Well, your patrons are part of the queer community, your coworkers are part of the queer community, and um, the community that you serve uh, has queer people in it. 
Um, and uh, one thing that I'll hear a lot is, oh, well, I don't know any trans people or I've never met a trans person. And my response to that is always that you know of. Um, what, Because what you mean when you say I've never met a trans person is I've never met a trans person who feels comfortable telling me that they're trans. So um, we're everywhere. We're, we're insidious like that, um, which is a joke. <laughs> um, but there's also currently in our country um, and around the world as well, there is an organized and extremely well-funded effort to silence and censor LGBTQ voices. And I'm sure as a library worker or someone who is aware of library issues, uh, you already know that. You already know the issues with book challenges and with censorship attempts. Um, going on throughout the country. So it is very relevant and it is happening right now and it is happening everywhere. So you are not immune to it. Um, I did see that we've got folks from all over the country, which is great. Um, some of the stuff I will be talking about might be more specific to Nebraska or more specific to uh, our those red state rural communities um, that we have, but this is, is a national issue. So if something sounds sort of irrelevant to where you're at, uh, just hang with me. Um, so, uh, and again, especially in those smaller communities, something that I hear a lot, um, in Nebraska is, well, there's no, there's no queer people here, um, which is probably not true. So this is a poll from Gallup and I updated it for the 2022 numbers. We don't have the 2023 ones yet. Um, but it is the amount of people per generation that identify, um, as a queer identity. So. As you can see, uh, almost 20% of Gen Z identifies as um, not straight or heterosexual, 11% um, of millennials, 3% of Gen X, and then about 3% of baby boomers. Um, and there's my graphic cut off, but it also has the uh, silent generation before baby boomers, um, if you look this up. But that is the percentages may seem small, but if you take that on a huge scale, you know, 20% of Gen Z, that's a lot of people. That's a lot of young adults because the jet, um, oldest Gen Z is now, you know, 27, 28 years old. So um, we are here uh, and you probably do know someone with an LGBTQ identity um, and statistically they're bisexual because that's what most people in this group identify as. But, um, <clears throat> just to point out, um, and then what more than 1 million non-binary adults live in the U.S., um, which was a study that they conducted. So a million people self-identified voluntarily as non-binary, and that's not including the people who uh, didn't want to out themselves on a Gallup poll, mm -hmm. right? So the, these numbers are probably higher. Um, mm -hmm. Just to, to emphasize, and again, um, if you're in a very small town and you're just like, well, these issues don't apply to me, there's no people here, um, you know, in my town of 500 people, there probably, again, there probably are. And if you don't know that there are, then that's probably because they don't feel safe expressing that identity, which you as a librarian can directly um, help to solve. So uh, the Trevor Project, which is a nonprofit um, serving LGBTQ youth, um, did this again? This is from 2022, a national survey. Um, and I won't go over all of these, but if you want to take a look, the and I, I hate to dwell on the sad, uh, sad statistics because I think we all are somewhat aware of them. Um, but 45% of LGBTQ youth seriously considered attempting suicide, um, and nearly one in five transgender and non binary youth attempted suicide. And then the uh, youth of color have even higher rates than that. And that is, so like half, that is so high. And that is an unacceptable number of queer youth who feel suicidal primarily due to the discrimination they face because of their identities. Um, and then if you look at the next one, it's youth who felt social support um, attempted reported attempting suicide less than half of the rate as those who felt no support. So obviously support is a huge factor and supporting youth in their identities is a huge factor 
in not only helping them feel better and helping them thrive, but also keeping them alive. So I just want to emphasize that when queer activists talk about um, how our kids are dying, that's not um, an exaggeration. That's not being dramatic. That's not being morbid for the sake of making a point. That is just the straight facts. Um, so this is, when we say this is life or death, we, we do genuinely mean it. Um, and again, as a librarian or as an educator, you can directly have an impact on making kids feel safe and adults too. Um, but one thing that, so those are the sad statistics, but one thing this survey did ask was what brings you joy? And I am so happy that that question was asked. Um, and so here are some of the responses that they got. And I pointed out some ones that we as librarians, as library workers, as educators can directly um, affect. So learning about LGBTQ history, being allies, um, re through representation, showing kids that they are not alone and that there are people like them. Again, being supportive, having a safe space to express themselves. Um, this one is my favorite, escapism slash fantasy slash fandom. And I work a lot with teens. Um, I'm a teen programmer here at my library. So um, I'm working a lot with that demographic. And uh, this is absolutely true. A lot of kids, especially LGBTQ kids, find a safe space to express themselves through fandom, through the books that they read, the shows that they watch, um, the comics that they're into and being able to explore identity through fiction. And that is a huge thing. And I mean, again, adults do that too, but especially for kids, that is a huge thing. So by being supportive, by creating a safe space within your library, by giving positive representation through the form of representative materials, um, you are able to make kids feel joy and uh, feel affirmed in who they are. Um, and that they don't have to be ashamed or that they don't have to hide or that they don't have to be scared for their well-being by just being themselves. I like also on this list of what brings you joy, so many things that are things that bring everyone joy. Yes. They're not, I mean, cooking, pets, your animals, uh, dancing, faith and spirituality, going to college, athletics, so many, no different. There's so many things that are the same about us all. And there is um, something that you also hear a lot is like, oh, like my kid on social media uh, decided that they were going to be trans so they could get clout on TikTok or whatever. And now all they do is talk about gender and think about gender and they didn't used to do that before. And it's that trans contagion. Um, no, we don't. Uh, Queer people don't just sit around all day thinking about being queer. It does impact a lot of our life, um, but we are just regular people um, mm -hmm. who like doing things like dancing and mm -hmm. being, I know, financial stability. Who doesn't get joy from being financial <laughs> people, right? Um, but like cooking, I love to cook. I love to create art. I love to write. I love to uh, cake decorate. That's one of my hobbies. You know, like um, if the world would just accept identities then people wouldn't have to think about it all the time right so mm -hmm. um yeah definitely um and so ways that five most common ways that lgbtq youth reported feeling supported by parents or caregivers um and you can look at that here and the main one is just again being supportive um been welcomed or uh welcoming to lgbtq friends and partners remember that kids listen kids especially listen. So if they hear you talking negatively about LGBTQ people in general, then no, they're not gonna come out to you because you've proven that you're not safe, right? Um, respectfully asking questions and talking about their identities. The huge, using their name and pronouns correctly, that's a huge one and that's literally the easiest thing to do. If somebody tells you what pronouns they use, just use those pronouns and you don't have to argue. You don't have to ask questions, just do it. And it's okay if you have trouble 
adjusting. If you use the wrong pronoun, say, oh, I'm sorry, correct yourself and then move on. Um, mm -hmm. I always find that it's worse when I get this overly um, apologetic sort of like, oh my God, I'm so sorry, I didn't mean to, I, I just wasn't quite, you know, whatever. That's worse than being misgendered. So just, oh, I'm sorry, correct yourself, move on. Easiest thing in the world to do, right? Mm -hmm. um, support, you know, support gender expression and educating yourself if you don't know what an identity is. So if somebody, um, a trusted person comes, or somebody comes to you as their trusted person, and says, I'm asexual, and you don't know what that means, instead of grilling them on the spot, say, okay, I'm going to research that more and look into different resources and educate yourself on what that means. Um, so what can you do? Um, and this is going to focus more than specifically on libraries here is make sure that your collection is diverse and intersectionally representative. So, um, in the mid 2000s, there was a bunch of queer young adult literature that came out that I describe as the sad white boy coming out story um, because it was a cisgendered white young man who was gay and he had a sad coming out story and was probably bullied. And then at the end of the book, he has his boyfriend and it's sort of happily ever after. Um, that's not very intersectionally representative, right? You want to make sure that you're representing uh, queer voices of color, um, disabled uh, queer voices um, from different uh, voices, from different economic um, and social classes. You know, you want everything um, to be represented. Uh, so part of that too, having an inclusive and proactively inclusive policy. Um, so don't just wait for something bad to happen in order to create a policy to combat it. Make sure you have policies on deck. And a lot of that was going to be intellectual freedom, which I'll talk more about. Um, have LGBTQ inclusive programming, um, which can be the form of book clubs, um, outreach, um, really any program that you normally do, you can make it LGBTQ inclusive, right? Um, community education, positive allyship, and advocacy. So let's let's go over a few of these things more. Um, so representation, again, this is from that Trevor Project survey. 89% of queer youth reported that seeing LGBTQ representation in TV and movies made them feel good about their identity. So that's the power of positive representation, right? Mm -hmm. And we hear that story again and again. If you need backup, um, if somebody challenges uh, that representation, you can look to ALA's um, policy, and this was written in 2010, and it hasn't necessarily been updated since then because their state, uh, their stance on this hasn't changed. Which is that you have an obligation to resist efforts that syst systematically exclude materials dealing with any subject matter, including sex, gender identity, gender expression, and sexual orientation. So as a librarian, you are obligated to um, resist attempts of censorship and uh, challenges to intellectual freedom. And specifically, you are obligated to resist those efforts against queer material. So you've got the ALA backing you up. Um, so collection development, this is what people always want to ask about is, I want to have all of these inclusive books, this positive representation in my library. Where do I go? Um, how do I find those books? Um, so I mentioned earlier, I'm on the Stonewall Book Award Committee. Um, every year, Stonewall Book Awards will release their top 10 lists. Um, and that's, uh, there's the adult fiction, adult nonfiction, and then there's youth fiction and youth nonfiction. Um, so you've got those lists, and again, those are committees <clears throat> that comprise uh, library professionals from across the country, all reading and evaluating these books. So you know the things on those lists are usually good, and you can also uh, justify purchasing those to um, your administration by saying, look, they're award winners, um, which I know we have to do here a lot. Um, 
So similarly, the ALA uh, Rainbow Roundtable also releases every year. It's called the Rainbow Book List. And so this is a huge list. Like there's a hundred or so books on this list um, for youth and adult. Um, and that gets released yearly. And they also have a blog that will um, review these books uh, regularly. So um, that's a great resource. Um, the Over the Rainbow Book List, which is another ALA thing, um, very similar. Um, this LGBTQ reads, this is one of my favorite websites. Um, it is just a collection of LGBTQ titles, including new release titles that they will talk about and summarize and review. Um, and the great thing about that website in particular is you can also search, uh, narrow it down and search by age group and then search by identity. So you want young adult fiction with bisexual protagonists. You can search specifically for that. Or you want picture books that show mixed families and you can specifically search for that. So this is a great resource. You can also subscribe to their newsletter um, and get once a week, um, here are like our top five this week or cover reveals or stuff like that. So um, I would definitely recommend that. Um, publisher lists. So all of the major publishers now, so um, Macmillan, Penguin, um, Tor is a big one. Um, they will have LGBTQ book lists that you can look at if you use like Edelweiss um, or your advanced reader copies, you can filter by LGBTQ titles. Um, I know right now Edelweiss has, the pu uh, several publishers on Edelweiss have like upcoming new release um, LGBTQ book lists for Pride, which is in June. So now is a great time to look at those lists because they all come out now. <laughs> Perfect timing time. prepared. Didn't even think about that. <laughs> um, and queer literature is a somewhat contentious term. And if you ask 10 different people what it means, you're going to get 10 different answers. But largely, I will describe queer literature as any work written by or for the LGBT community. So it's pretty broad, right? Um, and there's, again, a lot of different resources. These ones are just my favorites. Um, another thing you can do is just ask your community, like um, in June, if you put up a pride display, which I would encourage you to do is put up a pride display in June, have a little, um, like little slips of paper that says, what's your favorite LGBT book? And then look over those and see if you can add those to the collection. Yes, you will get trolls in those replies, but just throw them away. Um, it happens here too. Um, so this is just some publishers. Again, all of the major publishers, Simon & Schuster, Macmillan, Penguin, they all have queer books. Um, I put Tor over especially on my notepad because Tor has so many queer books and I received like two box, huge boxes of Tor books for the uh, fiction award committee that I'm on. Um, so they're one of my favorites, especially for genre fiction. Um, Boom Studios does comics um, and graphic novels, and there's a ton of queer titles from those as well. Um, so again, just take a look. Lots of different publishers doing a lot of uh, inclusive, and, and more and more now we see. Um, it used to be that you could only get queer books from indie or sort of underground publishers, um, and now you can get them from mainstream publishers. So. Great for collection development when you can only buy from like the three big ones, right? Um, those books exist. So cataloging, this is another big, um, big question is where do we put these books? Well, the answer is you put them where you would put any other book that falls into that category. So you shelf, you put YA books in your YA section, you put picture books in your picture book section, you put adult fiction in your adult fiction section, right? Um, you don't treat it different. Now, um, subject headings, um, make sure, or at least be aware of what subject headings you're using. Um, so the example like this transgender people versus transvestites, our catalog still will use the, um, for some of our older material still has the subject heading of transvestite. That was the acceptable term to use in the 70s and 80s. And that is absolutely not an acceptable term to use in 2023. So, um, you know, be aware of that. Um, 
nonfiction. So a lot of this comes to nonfiction. So the um, Dewey uh, 306.77, that is for abnormal or deviant sexual behavior. So what I would encourage you to do is look in your catalog and see how much of your queer nonfiction is under 306.77. Um, I've had people who have come up to me after this presentation and they're like, I looked in our library and every single one of our queer fiction books are still under that um, that number. So mm -hmm. obviously we don't want to describe queerness as an abnormal or deviant sexual behavior because it is not. Um, you also don't want books about LGBTQ history next to a book about pedophilia. That's not great. Um, bad look, as the kids say. So. Um, uh, take a look at that also. Um, and this, this is a tricky one. So is harmful material cataloged the same as neutral or positive information? Um, a lot of books, especially books that have been coming out recently, specifically about transgender issues are written and made specifically to look like they are positive and affirming books um, when actually they are full of dangerous misinformation um, and anti-trans rhetoric that is very, very harmful to trans people. Um, but unfortunately, these books will get the same subject headings as a genuinely positive and affirming book, which will lead to people uh, specifically like queer people and trans people who are looking for advice and guidance and safety to get a book that is tearing them apart um, and essentially re-traumatizing them. And I've had that happen with several of my patrons um, who have come up to me and said, I thought this book was going to help me. You know, I just came out. I thought this book was going to help me, but instead it just made me feel really awful because it said that uh, my identity was fake and that I wasn't real and that I was just seeking attention, blah, 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 right? Um, and that's a tricky issue. It really is because as, as libraries, we do try to maintain neutrality. Um, I'm not saying we shouldn't have those books on the shelves, um, especially if there is a demand for them as much as I hate it, right? Um, and when people check out those books, it makes me feel unsafe that a person is reading that and possibly believing that. Um, as a trans person, but that's our job. So, and I, I, I'll have to be honest, I don't have a solution for that. Um, I, there's no easy answer to how to solve that problem. It's just something that I really want people to be aware of. Um, and similarly, when you're, if you're putting together your trans day uh, remembrance display, um, make sure the books that you're putting on that display actually are positive and affirming representation um, because it's one thing for the book to be on the shelf or easily findable through a catalog. It's a completely other thing for you as a library staff to consciously put a book on display because that is an, an endorsement, right? You have decided this book is worthy of being promoted above other books by taking it out and drawing attention to it specifically. So just, just be aware of it um flip through it look for some of the dog whistles um which i'll go over later but be aware of it um another thing is is all of your lgbtq material automatically or de facto classified as adult even if it is not necessarily adult material um, for a long time all of our um if it was a graphic novel a queer graphic novel it would automatically go to the 741.5 adult section um, instead of going to our young adult graphic novel section, even though it was about teenagers or middle schoolers um, and it was clearly a YA or junior um, book, but because it had queer people in it, it automatically got sent to adult. So um, be aware of that. Um, and that's if that's that's part of having a, a proactive policy, right? Is do we automatically self-censor by hiding all of our queer stuff in the adult material or in the adult section. Um, another question is, should you interfile or indicate? So do you use spine labels or other markers, stickers, whatever, to identify LGBTQ material? Um, 
there's positive intentions behind that because you want to make it easier to find for the people who want it, but it also uh, leads to privacy issues, safety issues. It can also then just put a big target on any given book um, for a censorship attempt. So if you're putting rainbow stickers in all of your queer books, that's kind of giving an indicator to the people who are coming into libraries specifically to take those books and destroy them or to hide them, that these are the books that I'm looking for. Um, and I know that sucks uh, because I also would love to be able to just be able to quickly and clearly indicate for many people who want them what those books are. But again, that's the present reality of the situation we're in. So I would always say interfile, shelve them with other like materials, don't indicate that they are specifically queer. Um, and things like, you know, Stonewall winners, um, they're gonna have that Stonewall sticker on them anyway. So mm -hmm. there's already kind of that. Um, but yeah, inner file, don't indicate. Um, so proactive policy. Um, mm -hmm. Things like library card signups, do you ask for sex markers? Um, like do you really need to indicate male or female for someone setting up their library card? Like, why do you need that information? Um, having a, the ability to use a preferred name. So in our system, we use uh, Cersei Dynix um, here in Lincoln. There's uh, their legal name, and then there's a box you can put preferred name and check that. So that's all that you see uh, on the customer side and on our side too. So if you're able to enact that, um, I would encourage you to do that. And the question I always ask if you're tr struggling on how to ask, I always say, is the name on your ID the name you normally go by? And then um, people, some people will be like, well, yes, of course. Other people will be like, oh no, I, you know, it says Jeffrey, I go by Jeff, which is also important. You know, we want to, you want to respect people's choice of what they want to be called. But seeing like a little, especially kids for me um, and teenagers, seeing a queer teen sort of light up knowing that they don't have to put their, their legal name onto their library card and that in the library they will be known exclusively as their chosen name. Um, that's really important. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, like bathrooms, do you have gender inclusive bathrooms? Um, do you know how you would respond if somebody comes up to you and says, hey, there's somebody, there's a, someone's in the wrong bathroom, how would you respond to that? Mm -hmm. um, meeting rooms, are a tricky one. We've hosted here in Lincoln, we've hosted um, anti-trans groups in our meeting rooms and I, the trans employee was the one who had to go in there and fix their projector for them um, so they could watch their propaganda videos, which was a weird feeling that I didn't enjoy. Um, we want our, you know, obviously meeting rooms are open to anybody as long as it's not causing a disturbance or breaking library rules, but just it's good to be aware of who is in your meeting rooms. So if you have an, you know, an anti-trans hate group, oh, sorry, if you have an anti-trans hate group in your library, um, in your meeting rooms, be aware of that. So if they do need help, you don't send your trans employee in there, right? Because that's not safe for them. Um, staff training. So um, again, uh, We've, we had a pronoun training here in Lincoln, um, but uh, make sure your staff is just aware of these issues too. Um, and then how do you deal with harassment and safety issues, um, especially for queer staff? Like, are your staff protected? Are your staff safe? Um, that's really important. And we talk a lot about, again, protecting your customers and ensuring a safe space for your customers, but that extends just as much to your staff especially your queer staff who has to deal every single day with seeing challenges and censorship attempts against queer materials. It gets tiring, it gets exhausting, it gets demoralizing really, really quick. Um, so what are you doing to look after your, your people? Um, and I'll, I'll get back to challenges in, in a bit here because that's a whole other thing. Um, programming, so Drag Queen Storytime is obviously a controversial in certain ways. Um, let me go ahead and if you have any fears, let me assuage them. Drag Queen Storytime is not sexual. It is not the same drag show that you will see at you know midnight on a Saturday night in a gay bar. Um, it is just a drag queen who is dressed in a very fun and colorful and very appropriate outfit, reading a picture book to kids who like colorful, loud, 
people, right? Um, <laughs> yeah. That's all it is. And uh, Drag Queen Story Time or Drag Queen Story Hour is actually, there's a national organization. Mm -hmm. So if you want to host a Drag Queen Story Hour, reach out to your local chapter of Drag Queen Story Hour um, and ask for a reader and their readers are trained um, and they're also fully background checked. So all of those issues that can come up with having uh, drag queens around kids, Drag Queen Story Hour has thought of those and has proactively um, prepared for those. So reach out to that official organization and they will help you uh, and they also know how to deal with challenges really well. So reach out to them and they will help you put together an event. I would very much encourage that. Um, inclusive language. So, I mean, it's really easy. Instead of saying boys and girls, kiddos, friends. I, in Nebraska, we say folks all the time. So, you know, that's a good gender neutral um, way to address a crowd is folks. Um, teens. So, again, there's a lot under here because I work a lot with teens. Um, Doing a special pride event, uh, we had an LGBTQ book batch where we just talked about queer YA um, that the kids really enjoy. Um, you might notice that I have D and B under uh, queer inclusive programming, and I absolutely stand by that. Um, D and D is a great way for kids to explore identity, um, and so the kids who aren't quite ready to come out yet as trans are able to come into my d, d sessions and play a character of their identified gender and be referred to as the name that they choose and the pronouns that they choose. Um, and that's really affirming and positive for them. So uh, I highly encourage d, &D as a uh, inclusive program and I will always talk more about d, &D um, and its <laughs> benefits, but that's a different awesome. presentation. Um, <laughs> so I run, for adults, I run an LGBTQ book club um, you can reach out to uh, different local organizations if you don't feel comfortable hosting that. Um, so here in Nebraska, uh, one of our big local organizations is called Out Nebraska um, that will help you coordinate speakers and trainings and whatever else. So if you personally don't feel comfortable uh, putting together these sorts of things, reach out to your local LGBTQ groups. They will be more than happy to help. Um, and I said something here using a platform. So what books and voices are you promoting through displays and programming? Um, I have to admit, I do cringe a little every time one of my coworkers um, is like, yeah, we're gonna have a Harry Potter night. And it's like, do we need to though? Um, it's, I'm also gonna say, at least in my experience, teenagers aren't into Harry Potter anymore. So like, do we need to keep pushing that when the author is, a uh, transphobic icon and literally is like worshiped as a cult leader. Um, but uh, that's also a different presentation. <laughs> um, but again, just be aware of what you're promoting and that anything that you put on display or create a program around, that is your endorsement of that material. So be aware of the implications of that endorsement. Um, this, uh, so, the main thing with displays is that um, Pride is more than June. So if you only show queer books during June, um, you're not doing enough. Make sure you are incorporating those intersectional, that intersectional representation on all of your displays. Um, and, and be aware of that. Um, and you can go over this too. Um, again, these slides will be available, but these are just a couple of uh, dates. Uh, that you could create displays about if if you wanted to. Um, again, and even at my library, we really don't have a display for all of these things. Um, but uh, we make an effort to include LGBTQ voices in all of our displays, including our youth displays. Um, so, you know, I didn't they, know they, that one other. today, right there on your list is the International um, International Day Against Homophobia today. <laughs> So it is happy yeah, international totally day. Coincidence. Yeah. Uh, we didn't even plan that. This is a complete coincidence, but perfect. <laughs> so again, um, staff, uh, making sure your staff is is safe. Um, the big mm -hmm. ones that I'll talk about is tokenism. So if you have your one out queer employee, don't make them be the one who has to do all of the pride displays and all of the 
uh, purchasing for crew materials at all. You know, it should be spread out. Don't make your one out queer person be the, you know, I, I will describe it because this has happened to me several times. I am not the LGBTQ Lorax. I do not speak for the queers. Okay. So, um, make just make sure you're not doing that and again it comes from a good place of wanting oh well you're a member of this community so you should be representing them ask because a lot of people don't want to be the representative for their entire community they just want to do their job um and don't expect your queer staff to constantly out themselves at work similarly and this just applies generally don't ever out a queer person without their permission to do so um so if you're talking to someone and you're like oh well my coworker is trans you don't know unless you've asked specifically that that trans person wants to be outed as trans to your friend right so that's just sort of a, a general it's a respect thing and it's a safety thing and it's a privacy thing so again it's always best to just ask in confidence before assuming anything so um oh okay so another thing with this too is uh for name badges, including pronouns on name badges has become sort of a popular thing. Um, that comes again from a really good spot, but do ask your not cisgender employees if they necessarily want that. Um, my system uh, gave the option of adding your pronouns to your name badge, um, and I emphatically said no, because my options were to either lie about what my preferred pronouns was or automatically out myself since I don't necessarily pass um, to every single customer that sees my name tag. I didn't want to do either of those options. So my name tag currently does not have pronouns on it because um, I didn't feel safe. Okay, so challenges and advocacy, and this is the big one. Um, so, um, and again, we're seeing this all across the country, and this comes through formal challenges. So people who actually bother filling out the forms, um, quiet censorship is a big one, um, and it's coming from community members, from your coworkers, and library workers, and from your customers. Um, like I mentioned earlier, there are these big national organized efforts to do things like hide the pride was a big one, um, and I. At least at my library, we have that almost every single day where we find a, an LGBTQ book that has been purposefully hidden or misplaced so other people can't find it. Um, and also uh, staff safety plays into that too. So I will say um, the Nebraska Library Association Intellectual Freedom Roundtable does want uh, people to report in Nebraska um, report challenges that you formal or informal challenges to them so they can keep a record of it. Um, similarly, if you have formal challenges, you can report those to ALA. Um, not that they'll necessarily do anything about it, but there is a record of it so we can see how big of a problem it actually is. Um, also check with your state library association um, or your state library if you're outside of Nebraska, I don't know what other states have, but uh, ask and see if you, there's an intellectual freedom committee or an intellectual freedom roundtable that records those challenges. Um, so censorship. Um, Self-censorship is a huge thing. So if you are specifically excluding materials with LGBTQ content to avoid conflict, challenges, difficult conversations, then you are practicing self-censorship. Um, I've talked to a lot of people who have said, well, I don't want to order those books because I know they'll be challenged and um, that will bring a whole bunch of controversy and a whole bunch of litigation or whatever else. And I just don't want to deal with that. Well, I understand that nobody wants to deal with that. But mm -hmm. by preemptively excluding potentially controversial materials, you're also preventing people who need those materials from ever accessing them. Um, so you're you're denying people the opportunity to make that decision for themselves. Um, and especially as a public library, that's not really our place to make those decisions for people. As a school librarian, you know, you, there's a it's a bit of a different situation, but um, in the same way, there are kids in your school that need those books. There are people in your community that need those books. 
So you need to at least give them the opportunity to, to seek them out and to um, get that information that they want. Um, Recategorizing material. So this was an issue in Nebraska recently, but it's been an issue everywhere. Um, mm -hmm. Moving challenged materials or potentially challenged materials to the adult section um, is a form of censorship. If it is a youth item and you are not keeping it in the youth section because you don't want someone to challenge it being there, that is a form of censorship. And I know, again, we I get it, I'm conflict avoidant, um, believe it or not. Um, I don't like having these difficult, nasty conversations. They're hard, they're emotionally difficult. Um, and there's other things you want to get on with, right? So I, I do understand the impulse to do that, but it is censorship and it is something you should not be doing. Again, give people um, who might need those books the opportunity to find those books. And I guarantee you that you could by having that book out there for someone especially for a kid you could change that person's life you mm -hmm. could change that kid's life you could be it could be the difference between that kid feeling suicidal and that kid feeling secure in themselves outright yes um but that's true so have those materials available same like i've seen fiction um lgbtq fiction moved to the nonfiction section just to avoid um, potential conflict. So instead of it being in fiction, it begins moved to with all of the other LGBTQ nonfiction books. So it's kind of a, just a big queer section. Not great. Don't do it. I, that that one confuses me totally. It's not that I mean, fiction and nonfiction. There's not really a <laughs> right. How do you even make that? like argument. I don't get that one at all. Mm. And yet people do. So all right. <laughs> um, and then so censorship versus selection. And this is something that we deal with all the time, right? As librarians. Um, there's a difference between specifically excluding queer materials because you're trying to avoid conflict, opposed to based on you know, the statistics you have, the usage and circulation statistics that are available to you and all of the other resources, thinking this book wouldn't be relevant to my community or wouldn't be popular in my community or wouldn't get checked out. Um, now, caveat on that is don't assume that just because a book is queer, it wouldn't be checked out. Um, but, you know, if you're like the my very small town library of, you know, in my town of 500 people, the majority of people who come to the library are age 65 plus, and they like reading historical fiction and murder mysteries, you know, mm -hmm. a young adult book about a, a drag show might not be something that goes with, you know, what you normally order. Um, that being said, there are books that would be popular amongst a 65 plus crowd that are a murder mystery or historical fiction that are also queer. So, you know, there's, and the thing about queer fiction is it comes for all audiences and for all different genres. So there's really no excuse to not have it um, at this point in time. Um, so there's queer sci-fi, sci there's queer fantasy, there's queer historical fiction, there's queer murder mysteries, there's queer, you know, there's queer cookbooks. There's queer gardening books, there's everything. So again, no excuse to not have it. Um, and obviously use your own personal judgment, but worst case scenario, if the book isn't popular, it'll get weeded anyway based on circulation statistics after a couple of years, right? So right. have the book available um, for the people who need it, even if you don't think that anybody in your community needs it. And honestly, in those communities where you're like, oh, well, there's no, again, there's no queer people here. No one will read this. Those communities need it the most. Um, yeah. And, and being able to uh, expose people to different cultures and different mm -hmm. uh, ideas is a very powerful tool of the public library. Um, and, and, and someone just is commenting here about it saying it's also, you, know, you were talking about these small towns where the only people that use the library, they're 65 plus. Is that what your entire town is made of? made up of his people though you know this person's right. commenting if you expand and you've got to try it out like you said 
put books in your library of all topics that maybe those 65 plus people are not interested in and you'll bring in the rest of your community to use the library exactly and they're not great. using it because there's nothing for them put something in there and try it out like you said your statistics will show that eh, we tried it wasn't the right you know genre whatever it gets weeded we'll try some other topic um but you know that's a great comment from from the audience here that awesome. you you want this is, this is a hard thing in all types of library work getting the non-users to use the library how the heck do we do that <laughs> and this is a way think of the books that you don't think your people want put them in the library and then oh suddenly and you know even if a book doesn't check out necessarily someone coming in and seeing that you have that book available that is an indicator to them that oh this is a safe place this is a place where i am welcome mm -hmm. uh, so even if they don't read that book by having that book there, you are, that is part of creating a safe space in your library and making your library welcoming to everyone in your community. Yeah, it sends a great signal out there. Yes. Yeah, wonderful signal. Um, so a bit more on the advocacy piece again, um, report your challenges, um, turn your customers into advocates. So um, obviously like as a public library and as a part of a city department, we're not allowed to, you know, uh, have a political bias one way or the other, or we're not supposed to, um, but turn your customers into advocates for the library and then the other aspects will come for it. So most people are pro-library, like the large majority of people in, in the country are pro-library. It's generally seen that libraries are good things to have. Um, so if you, you know, let your customers know, like we're facing a lot of challenges, we're facing a lot of people coming in um, with hateful rhetoric and trying to stop us from doing our jobs and from giving you the library service that you have come to expect. Um, that's very galvanizing for, for a lot of folks. So, and the community is, is the people who you need the support of. Um, I do have a QR code here for the NLA advocacy tool um, with the Nebraska Library Association. It, uh, advocacy committee has worked really really hard in order to foster um, advocacy in Nebraska libraries so um, I highly encourage you to check that out um, if you're not in Nebraska again check with your uh, local state organization uh, whatever that may be and see if they've got an advocacy group working and how you can um, help with that um, okay so a couple of the dog whistles to look out for, especially if you're reviewing a book um, that are anti-queer, uh, these ideas that any association that being queer automatically makes you a sexual deviant or a pervert, um, that you are not safe to be around children, that you are sexualizing children by um, affirming their identity, which is obviously untrue. Uh, prurient interests is a big one. That word means nothing. By the way, like legally, that term prurient interest is so vague that it can mean literally anything. Um, so uh, that's one they like to use a lot. If you look at a bunch of the anti-trans or the anti-queer, um, specifically book or education bills, around the country, they almost all use the term prurient interests because it is so ill-defined. Um, referring to it as gender ideology, that's a dog whistle for anti-trans rhetoric. Same with uh, someone describing themselves as gender critical. If they're gender critical, that means that they are anti-trans. Um, TERF, which is a term we hear a lot, uh, which is trans exclusionary radical feminist. There is nothing radical or feminist about TERFs. Uh, I will also go ahead and say, uh, well, my controversial hot take here. Turf is not a slur. It is just a term to describe a transphobic woman, typically a woman, a cis woman who doesn't want trans people to exist. Um, and then the, unfortunately, because those are also the, the purple, white, and green, that's also the colors for the gender queer flags, but it's also the like suffragette colors that have been co-opted by um, these trans exclusive radical feminists. So if, you see that usually on Twitter, but just be aware of it. Um, things like family values, protecting children or protecting women. Again, they sound good. We want to protect children. We want to protect and support women. But those terms are used to then get people into the anti-trans um, 
the on the anti-trans train um indoctrination again no queer people are not indoctrinating and brainwashing children they're just trying to we're not brainwashing your kids we're not trying to indoctrinate your kids we just don't want your kids to kill themselves um, because we used to be depressed suicidal queer teenagers and we don't want that for kids um we want them to love themselves and feel affirmed and be happy and thrive in life um the two sides are both sides fallacy especially in this argument wherein mm -hmm. if one side is trans people are humans and should be afforded the same dignity um, of existence as everyone else and the other side is no they shouldn't that's not exactly an equally balanced argument so the idea that if you have affirming uh, queer materials in your library in order to be fair or to be neutral you have to have violent anti-queer rhetoric also in your library that is just categorically false that is not true that is not a, a true equivalency um and that's something that you will hear a lot is oh well you don't have anything from the other side well the other side wants us dead so and we just want to be here so that is that fair you know just think about it um uh and i i always bring that up because that's one that i hear a lot um similarly i mean if i say i am trans and my pronouns are he him that's not my opinion that is a statement of a fact so if you if your opinion is that actually i'm not trans and that i'm a woman you're just wrong is mm -hmm. it's not your opinion you're just wrong right okay so that was my little side tangent on that um, but again it's something i hear a lot so um this is again, uh, there's a QR code here, but when these slides are available, there's a link. This is just legislation of concern in 2023 um, that specifically affects libraries. And a lot of it is anti-queer. A lot of it is preventing access to uh, LGBTQ information or resources in libraries. So it's good to just be aware. Um, the ALA Rainbow Roundtable also has a toolkit, um, which is this huge document full of everything from collection development to how to deal with challenges to programming ideas um, and everything else so that is a great resource um, that i would absolutely recommend especially if you need sort of a starting point um, and then here's my contact information um, both my work email and my personal email so if you have any questions or you want to follow up with something or um, you just want to say hi i like it when people say hi so um there's that and then at the end here is just my my source list um with links but i'll leave that up there for right now and then again mm -hmm. these slides will be available yes absolutely and that's all i have for today yeah awesome thank you um um thanks lane this this was a, a wonderful session um that we've talked about um various LBGTQ issues on um, Encompass Live and previous shows. You all can look in our archives for previous um, reading diversely sessions we've done and other things. Um, but it's always good to have, you know, everything is changing. Things are changing so much and there's lots going on. Um, and it's, it's getting, like you said, more and more dangerous and an issue that we have to be on top of. Um, so this is great. I'm so glad we finally get you on the show. If anyone does have any questions, if you want to ask, we are a little after 11 a.m., but that's okay. Um, we don't get kicked off our show because we hit the official end time. We'll go as long as it takes for anyone who has any questions or comments. Um, so go ahead and type in your questions section. I see that some are coming in. That's great. We will stay as long as we need to to answer them and get through everything. Um, if you do have to uh, take off because you just plan to be here till 11, that's fine. We're recording, so you can always come back and um watch the recording um when i have that up probably by the end of the day tomorrow it should be up and processed and ready for um you all to watch um, um so yeah please um any comments any questions you have any comments if you've dealt with any of this at your library we'd love to hear your stories too um so let's see here what we've got first question um what programming do you recommend for ages five to 11 um, besides drag queen story time? They already got that down. Um, so what other kind of programming for that age, um, you know, five to 11? So would that be tween um, or less than tween, I guess? I don't know, where does tween start? <laughs> so, um, 
I will say that again, I usually do teen and adult stuff. So youth programming isn't necessarily my, my biggest wheelhouse. Um, but I would say for that age group, um, you don't need to necessarily have a queer specifically focused program. Um, but having, I mean, in your like story time rosters, right, have books that include um, queer people, queer protagonists, mixed families, stuff like that, just again, included into um, your, your story time rotation. I would also say um, anything that, again, kids can explore and express um, an identity. And at that age, it's going to be, it's very fun to dress up and run around and pretend to be a princess or a knight mm -hmm. or a dragon, um, you know, something like that. But uh, so one of the um, programs that we've had at our library, it was sort of like Wild West themed. And so um, instead of the kids either being a cowgirl or a cowboy, they just got to be a cowpoke. Um, and they got to dress up and there wasn't like here are the girl hats and here are the boy hats it was just here are the ways you like you can pick your horse and you can pick your cowboy hat and you can design your own little you know sheriff badge and then we'll run around and play um and the um uh rainbow roundtable toolkit um that i mentioned earlier they they do talk about youth programming um and i do apologize for that not being a very satisfactory answer um i'm not again uh, youth programming is not, or, or that that uh, that younger group is not um, who I normally work with. Um, yeah, but that's good to just try and make things not gender specific. Just be, you know, take that out of all of your planning and make it as non as you can, and then they can do whatever they want. Yeah, and we've had two things like crafts or color sheets. That I mean, I had a nine year old. Um, hand me a coloring sheet she did and she had colored it in the rainbow flag and then i think the um pan flag and she was like this is me and she handed that to me and so just having that available um it was sweet and i almost cried um yeah awesome. queer kids make me want to cry a lot <laughs> but um you know just having that sort of thing available and when a kid does present that information to you you know be like oh my god thank you so much for telling me that um, and that I'm your trusted person. That means a lot to me. And then, you know, I'm going to hang this up right on the wall here, stuff like that. Awesome. Um, all right. Um, we've got a, a bunch more questions coming in. That's great. Um, so here's another one from the same uh, person. What call number do you suggest for nonfiction? Or, um, and they say 612. Is that uh, Yeah. So um, 612. See, now I'm, I'm getting called out. Um, <laughs> well, yeah, um, it's just that, that uh, what was it, 306.77, that deviant, it's um, abnormal sexual behavior one that you want to avoid. Um, mm -hmm. And at my library, we pretty much moved out of that one um, and into the, there is a specific call number that is used for like LGBTQ history and stuff. Um, and I don't remember what it is off the top of my head, but 612 sounds, sounds right. There's also, I think there's another 300 one um, that we put a lot of stuff in and I can picture it in my head on my shelf, but again, I don't remember what the actual call number is. Um, but I, yeah, say what the, um, what, uh, what is the actual subject matter of it? So is it history? Is it like poetry? Is it, um again is it talking about like a social movement put that where it belongs with other like items and if you want to send me an email asking me that question and then i can actually like look it up and look what that number is i will totally do that i just don't have that with me right now yeah uh, all right, thanks. Uh, let's see. Um, <laughs> sorry, I'm reading through this one because it's longer. Uh, okay. Um, all right, so this person says, uh, I want to say thank you for the ALA resource. That's amazing. Uh, first, uh, 
And then any suggestions for working with staff who tolerate but do not celebrate the queer community, uh, particularly when we are doing pride displays and pride parade celebrations, while they aren't doing anything wrong, in quotes, they also aren't making queer staff and community feel appreciated and welcome. Sounds like more of a, we'll tolerate it, but we're not gonna go, yeah, they tolerate but do not celebrate. Um, and that's, you know, um, that's an attitude you'll run into a lot. And it, it kind of goes along with the, the cliche is, oh, well, I don't mind it. Just, you know, do you have to be so loud about it or do you have to rub it in my face all the time? Um, to which the response is, you know, existing and celebrating. Okay, so the actual response to that is I wouldn't have to celebrate it if people didn't try to actively stop me from existing, right? Um, the, the eventual goal of pride is that we no longer have to have it because it's just a very just mm -hmm. part of existence that we, we all acknowledge. Um, I would say that and as, as hard as it can be, especially if you yourself are part of the LGBT community, um, meet those, those folks where they're at. Um, don't be overly aggressive, but do try to um, educate. And even just, I mean, so if you start them out with like a book recommendation, so, hey, you know, I know that you normally read, um, you normally read murder mysteries. Have you tried this book? Um, that's a queer murder mystery and you don't even have to say that it's queer just you know recommend the books to them and have them read it and explore it themselves um, mm -hmm. and again having sort of like I don't want to say sensitivity trainings because that's kind of a loaded term right but mm -hmm. uh, having a, a staff discussion like a community mm -hmm. discussion and having the actual, if you have LGBTQ members on your staff who are comfortable sharing and talking about their experiences, um, have them just say, you know, this is what it's like being a queer library staff member. Um, I know I've had a lot of, uh, I guess, impact um, at my library when we share those experiences and I say, listen, I'm, I'm scared to come to work every single day. I'm scared to run teen programs. And I'm scared to say the wrong thing because it would just take one parent saying that I did something wrong to their kid to, you know, get me fired. Mm -hmm. Like it's scary, it's intimidating, it's exhausting. Um, and those are those are harrowing experiences. But um, hearing that directly from, especially a coworker that you work with every day, can really open someone's willingness to um, challenge why why pride would make them so uncomfortable um, mm -hmm. and confront that within themselves. Yeah, it's awesome, thank you. Um, here's a good question that's it's, uh, to be a quick one and if anyone is wondering the same thing, and they say, oh, they answered back. Thank you so much, Ling, great answer. Thank you, that helps a lot. <laughs> um, so wants to know, can we email you scenarios of situations we have had with patrons and staff alike and ask for advice? Um, I feel like it's too long to deal with on here right now, LOL. Um, and thank you so much for this. So I assume, you know, the emails are out there. <laughs> yes, absolutely, email me. Um, you can also, um, if, if you're in Nebraska as well, um, email uh, the NLA diversity, it'll just get forwarded to me. But um, as uh, the diversity group um, that we're just kind of building up from scratch, basically one of my goals for that group is to be able to provide support um, for libraries and dealing with these specific issues. Mm -hmm. So you can email me directly. Again, my work email is up there. My personal email is up there. But if you forget that, um, if you just uh, email NLA, diver NLA diversity, I think um, mm -hmm. I will also take a look at that there. Yeah, awesome. Thank you. Um, how oh, here's another one about uh how or what way do you recommend we try to adopt gender neutral or trans accepting bathrooms in the library so um that? and that it will sort of depend on what your setup is so at one of our libraries we had two single cell bathrooms um that were literally exactly the same um 
So we just took down the signs and put up unisex bathroom signs and there was no, you know, um, nobody really noticed because uh, of the exact same bathroom. And again, it's a single cell. So that's really easy if you happen to be in that situation. Um, otherwise, I mean, it, again, it's a tricky situation. It's really going to depend on if you feel it's something that you'd be able to do. I mean, if it's just taking down signs, because most bathrooms are pretty much the same. It's just mm -hmm. usually one has urinals and one doesn't. Yeah. Um, so I've seen it before where the signs say bathroom and then bathroom with urinals, right? Or like- For anyone who's more comfortable using those, they know which, which one yeah. to use. Yeah. Um, and I would say what it primarily comes down to is how you as staff respond to if somebody reports that someone's in the wrong bathroom. And that will genuinely happen, um, especially at some of these bigger libraries um, where, you know, there are, we try to protect trans people, but there are just genuinely creepy people out there. And yeah. oh yeah, <laughs> like, people out there who will go into a bathroom to spy on people. And that obviously needs to be addressed um, and dealt with. But um, I think it's it mostly comes down to how you respond to if somebody uh, says someone's in the wrong bathroom, um, mm -hmm. which I would go, you know, check, make sure, you know, okay, there's not genuinely some creep in there taking pictures. Um, yeah. And then uh, just say, you know, have a poll, like, people can use whatever bathroom that they feel most comfortable using as long as they're not bothering anyone else or they're not, you know, not bothering anyone else, but they're not actively interfering with anyone else. Mm -hmm. um, and again, just gender neutral bathroom signs goes yeah. a pretty long way. Yeah, using the bathroom that doesn't necessarily have the sign on it that is you shouldn't be an issue. I mean, we all know the the um, the cliche, which isn't a cliche because I've experienced it for um, when you do have female male bathrooms, when um, there's a giant line acts out the door of the female bathroom because of just how it works and none in the male. And I've popped over there and said, you know what? I can't, I just can't wait. <laughs> I'm going in there and it, and it, it, it's just, is what it is. <laughs> you use what you need to use because it's available. And if you're not, like I said, if you're not doing anything illegal or disturbing then everyone's just doing what they do in their bathrooms <laughs> um all right um got a couple more questions here but i do want to read this before the person that says they're, they're taking off here um thanks so much for all the info here what a great workshop um and for answering our questions and suggesting wording to use um it really helps us navigate library life and stay upbeat and encouraged. <laughs> that's good. I mean, it is some serious things, but that's good. Yeah, it's it, you can do it and make it be a you know a good thing in the end. Um, someone says they will be emailing you with some more questions. Um, and uh, yeah, awesome. Uh, all right, so I got a couple more questions I do want to get ans answered here. Um, you mentioned that some well-funded groups want to silence the LGBTQ community. Um, are these groups mainly religious conservatives? And do we know? <laughs> um, okay. See, this is where I walk the the very thin line between stating an objective fact and saying something too political that could uh, cause trouble with my library board. But um, mm -hmm. the the objective answer is yes. Um, mm -hmm. That is typically what these groups are or who they are aligned with um a lot of that is not like it's not one particular political candidate or um one particular like well okay so like we all know the westboro baptist church right they're sort of infamous um and they thrive on that infamy um but there are other loose organizations but um mm -hmm the idea of, of Christian values, and I'm saying that in quotation marks because I don't believe that is actually, you know, that's not something that all, all people who identify with the Christian faith would necessarily ascribe to their belief system. Um, yeah. But that is a term that is used 
frequently, and that is all a, a basis of a lot of these challenges. Um, and if you see these formal challenges, um, especially when they're brought up in like city council meetings, opposed to a, a official library challenge, um, the basis used is that they're not, these books are going against their personal religious values and therefore should be ruined from the library. Um, and a lot of the ones to look out for is like, uh, so in, in Nebraska, there's a group called Protect Nebraska Children um, that was behind a lot, a lot of challenges. Mm -hmm. um, and I believe they've changed their name, but that group is still active and still uh, yeah, I know of them. Yeah. And organizing those challenges. Yeah. Um, and it's it's going to be different depending on where you are, um, what that group is. But um, there are there is like a lot of coordination and organization that that goes into those um, efforts. Mm -hmm. I hope that is a, a diplomatic and non. Mm -hmm. I think. Yeah. <laughs> um. All right, I guess I have one more question here. And I just want to say, actually, I just noticed um, someone on here, Vicki, you've got your hand raised. Do you want me to unmute you to say something or did you want to, is that just, all right, no problem. Um, all right, so a couple of questions here. How would you go about introducing LGBTQIA plus books within the school system? Um, I believe they must maybe talking about uh, K-12. Sure. Um, and again, I'm not a school librarian, so um, there very well may be uh, certain policies or procedures that you have to follow within your district. Um, and I obviously, I don't know what those may be. Um, but I would say genuinely just order them like you would order any other book. And a lot of these, these books, especially K through 12, um, they are coming from major publishers. So they're coming from yeah. Simon mm -hmm. Schuster and Macmillan and um, I already said that, sir. And Penguin. Um, so you can order them along with your regular books. I mean, like, um, if you're getting a bunch of picture books about uh, kids from different backgrounds, then LGBTQ books would qualify with the rest of those picture books. Um, same with, like, if for young adults materials, and there is. Um, when I give my presentation about the, the history of queer literature, uh, the period we're currently in, I have it as Yas, uh, YA, Yas, Queen, because um, <laughs> there's just so much YA now. Uh, yeah. I feel as though there's like 15 new queer YA books a week. Um, <laughs> That's a lot to keep up with. <laughs> but yeah, but those are, I mean, it's going to be fantasy and sci-fi and slice of life mm -hmm. and um, a book about uh, you know, a queer middle schooler is not necessarily going to be about exclusively the queer experience, but it's going to be about, you know, having issues with friends and cliques and mm -hmm. not fitting in and struggling with school like every other middle grade book um, right. is going to be. So, and so I know I said earlier, like specifically excluding materials or not um, promoting materials just because they're queer is. A form of censorship. I would say the other side of that would be normalizing it would not be censorship, right? So by just ordering these books and having them in the collection and presenting them on equal grounds with any other book that you may order, um, that's a great way to just incorporate it in. And people won't necessarily know that it needs to be challenged um, unless they're specifically being told usually by somebody else that this book exactly those groups that you're talking about are the ones that yeah make up those lists and whatnot um yeah just like you were talking earlier about the recommending uh murder mystery a mystery to the 65 plus patron that happens to have um queer characters in it it's could be it's just a great murder mystery that happens to have these people in it. I mean the the books are even these books that are that have those characters it's not all about that in these right. books oftentimes they just you know, the, you know these people as you said exist in our world um just like any of uh, any 
you know, we have books that have male protagonists, female, different races, and it's just the story is great, and it just happens to be these type of people are in the story. That's not the focus of the whole story. So, um, and that's great because, like you said, normalizing. Um, and here's a question, but I think it's just a great suggestion, and we're going to wrap up with this, I think, because we're getting almost to 11:30. Um, our summer reading program theme this year, if you know, is um, about friendship all together now. Um, and they asked, would this be an opportunity to include juvenile literature, LBGTQIA, with the same themed books relating to the program? Yes. 100% yes. <laughs> I think that's 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 perfect. Yes, it's it's about being supportive of everybody and everyone, no matter what they're like. Yeah. I know some libraries have struggled with the theme altogether, and I'm like, what does that mean? Well, it, it's about friendship and acceptance, and yeah. It is. It's a very vague theme. Um, we've struggled with it too, but the the <laughs> positive of that is that you can pretty much do whatever you want and then justify yeah. it with the theme. So. Mm -hmm. Be nice, yeah. All right, I think that's we'll wrap that up for the questions. Um, as Lane said, please um, email questions, comments, anything you want to them. Um, if you want to discuss issues at your library, uh, Lane is happy to do that. So we've got some thank yous coming in, very informative, and I love this one here. Fantastic, keep up the rainbow love. Absolutely, <laughs> we will. Um, all right, so thank you so much, Lena. Like I said, I'm so glad we were able to get you um, on the show since we had, uh, you, know, you were ill earlier, but this is um, great. All right, so thank you everybody for being here today and sticking around with us. Uh, thank you, Lane. I'm gonna pull back presenter control to my screen to wrap up today's show with my usual wrap up here. There we go. Um, there's the uh, event page for today. Um, as I said, we are recording the show and it's going to be on our archive page. Um, if you um, type in N Compass Live, the title of our show in your search engine of choice, it's the only thing called that on the internet. Uh, nobody's allowed to use that name. <laughs> uh, so you can find us and you'll find our upcoming shows here. And then at the bottom of the list is the link to our archive and Compass Live shows. Today's show will be at the top of the list here. Um, like I said earlier, by the end of the day tomorrow, um, go to webinar YouTube. I'll have all that processed and I'll put it up here. Uh, Lane, you can send me a link to your slides and I will add that as well. So you'll have a link to the recording and to the slides. Everyone who attended today's show and registered for today's show will get an email from me letting you know when it's available. We do also have a Facebook page uh, that we post to. If you are a Facebook user or like to use Facebook, you can follow us there, like us there. Um, here's a reminder about today's show, but a presenter, and then um, where's the last one? There we go. And I post when the recording is available on our page as well. So see that there. Um, we also wish out onto Twitter and Instagram and where else um, using the hashtag Encomp Live, a little abbreviation for our show. So you can search for that online as well. Um, while I'm on the archives here, I'll show you there is a search feature here so you can look and see if we've done any topics, uh, shows about anything else. Um, you mentioned Dungeons and Dragons and I did want to show we um, had that previous show that I know you were involved with, but you did not do this particular one because you weren't available, but Critical Hit, Tabletop Gaming in the Library. Lane's colleague, Caitlin, did this session for us. All those resources about running D&D &D in your library. So <laughs> this is what you do, right, as well? Absolutely. And yeah. uh, if you, again, if you ever want to talk about D&D &D in any capacity, <laughs> email me as well. I will always talk about it, so. <laughs> yeah, this is one. Yeah, one of my one of my loves. I, my husband and I and our friends have been playing D and D for longer than we can remember. So, um, but you can search here, watch any of our recordings. Do pay attention. This is our full show archives. I'm not going to scroll all the way to the bottom because it's a giant list. But going back to when it goes back to when Encompass Live first premiered, which was in, which was January 2009. So we're going on 15 years worth of recordings, and they are all here. As long as we have a place to host, which right now it's all on YouTube, we'll always have our recordings out there for everyone to watch. Um, but do pay attention to the original broadcast dates of anything. Um, some shows will stand the test of time and still be great and useful, but some things will become old, outdated. Uh, resources and services may have changed drastically or might no longer exist anymore. Links might be broken because things have gone away. Uh, people might work, not work at the same library they did when we first presented. Um, but just be aware of that when you are watching any of our recordings. Um, but this is something the librarians do. We keep things for historical purposes and we will as long as we have um, a place to host them. 
All right, so that'll wrap it up for today's show. Um, we've got our upcoming shows here over the next few months. You can see you already filled in, and I hope you'll join us next week when um, we'll have another Nebraska library, uh, Jenny White, the lab director in our Schuyler Nebraska Public Library, talking about how they have been doing some work um, with building partnerships in different languages and dealing with that. So um, please do sign up for next week's show and any of our future um, Encompass Lives. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Lane. Good to see you. Maybe we'll have you on again for talk about some other things you've been doing um, in the library. <laughs> Um, and hopefully we'll see you all on a future episode of Encompass Live. Bye-bye.